All right, everybody, welcome back to the Mayday Monday podcast. This is the October 2023 podcast. Uh, good to see you all again. I want to start off by um, apologizing to you guys for the repeat podcast for last month. Uh, a lot going on here at Mayday Monday headquarters, so it was tough to get to get another show out uh, for that. So um, I hope you all, if you could put the slides up there, Mark. I hope you all didn't mind watching um, that podcast about Wilmington, Delaware firefighters. I know um, I was, again, uh, honored to be talking to those three people from um, Wilmington, and they had a, um, a good story for us to hear. And again, I don't know um, if you picked up on the introduction to last month's, but uh, there was a couple of key things in there about training. Um, that if you haven't looked at it, go back and get it and, and where, uh, their training paid off. And that will also, you will also hear that again in tonight's podcast. So please go check that out. Um, that was again last month's and it's always, it was a, a another skill drill. That's a favorite here at Mayday Mondays is air management and getting out and, and really getting intimate with your SCBA and knowing what its capabilities are. So if you haven't done that, go go check that out and, um, you know, find some time for uh, air management training and look at that podcast. Uh, before we get too deep, I would like to review with you the uh, firefighter fatalities that have happened since the last time we got together. Um, there was a, a firefighter, Joe Parrish, from DeBold, Texas. He was responding in his private vehicle to a mutual aid call for help when uh, he was involved in a crash. The next one, you may uh, recognize that um, town. Louisa, Virginia is my hometown or my fire department. And Mia was uh, one of my firefighters. 20-year-old Mia Etheridge was uh, killed in a fire truck accident. She died from injuries from the fire truck accident. Um, again, 20 years old, a uh, great kid, really had a um, good future here in Louisa County Fire and EMS. And uh, it's a big hole, big hole here that we have felt over the last, uh, really since July when the accident happened. But um, you may hear, you may see a uh, Mia Monday come one day where we touch on what we can learn from that uh, tragedy. Uh, Josh Kogel of the Kavauer, South Dakota Fire Department. Josh is, was a chief there and they were fighting a commercial building fire and he suffered a medical emergency. Troy Thompson, Seven Springs Fire Department, volunteer fire department in North Carolina. He uh, also suffered a medical emergency while on the scene of a vehicle crash, working a vehicle crash incident. And Earl Dyer, Earl Dyer was a 40-year member of the Richmond, Virginia Fire Department, battalion chief there. He also suffered a medical emergency while on duty. So please take a few moments and think of these members, think of their families, think of their friends, think of their fire departments. Uh, this will be a tough time for them as they recover from these uh, these losses. And um, if we if you can have a few moments, say some things for them. If you pray, pray for them and uh, let's honor our fallen. With that, uh, this is this month's. Mayday Monday, uh, maybe you've seen the post already uh, that came out on the first Monday of the month. Um, and again, it's a Halloween theme <laughs> uh, because it's October, but uh, ticks or tr tricks or treats, uh, right? On, um, is, it a, is it a good tool for you or is it, um, has it, is it not the best tool for you? And that's kind of what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about it with a friend of mine, um, captain from west virginia and i say that west virginia look got my <laughs> this is important west virginia <laughs> this is important to me um joey's important to me for a couple things one uh he lives in west virginia and uh my daughter goes to school in west virginia west virginia university and as that as the tangled web and the long arm of the fire service works right i reach out to joey joey my kids going to west virginia can you help me what does joey do he sends me some names hey here's some buddies here's some pals right and if and if you need anything i know buck a couple hours away 
but if you need anything, right, uh, we can get help that way. So um, that's one one reason why it's important. Another reason why it's important is um, he's a he's an amazing trainer when it comes to to this kind of stuff. And then thirdly, um, he he volunteered to come on the Mayday Monday podcast. Um, <laughs> if you read the the post that's already been out, um, one of the there's a couple things featured in there. One is uh, Joey's story. The other is a, a line of duty death from Baltimore that happened in um, early 2000s. Uh, that firefighter died in a row house fire. And one of the recommendations that came out of that, that incident from NIOSH was that firefighters need to be properly trained on thermal imaging cameras. As I'm going to press, right, as we're getting into this, uh, writing the, the, the information for the Mayday Monday uh, skill drill, um, I reached out to a friend, Andy Starnes, um, Joey's boss, friend, uh, he teaches with. And um, I said, um, Andy, I need some help. Can you give me some stuff? And in the meantime, he sends it out to his his uh, his group. Joey responds back. Hey, Tony, um, I'd love to talk about my incident. Hey, we can make that happen. So uh, with competing calendars involved, uh, we were able to pin, to nail down a time and it's right now. This time is uh, when we're going to talk about uh, Joey, what he's got and what he does. And uh, we'll get into to that. So if you can put the slides back up. It also says so much about the fire service, right, about how small it is and uh, six degrees or really it's probably like three degrees, three degrees of separation. Yes, sir. <laughs> have somebody you can reach out to. This person can call that guy and, and so on. So let's get into this and learn a little bit about Joey and what he's got. Here's what I know about Joey. I know he's a captain in the Buckhannon, West Virginia Fire Department. Um, again, big, big uh, instructor, big uh, traveling all over the place. In fact, he just came back from, from Colorado. I'm sure he's going somewhere else next week. But he's from Buckhannon, West Virginia. You know that we like to uh, to highlight the uh, the town that they're from and uh, the fire department. So uh, we'll get into that. But, Joey, tell me a little bit about introduce yourself to the crowd here, would you? Yeah, so I'm I'm Captain Joey Bax. As, as Tony just said, I'm from the Buchanan Fire Department uh, here in Buchanan, West Virginia. I've been on the job for about 17 years. Um, small town, small community. You know, everybody knows everybody. Just a little over 5,000 people in our, our small city. Um, but we cover a much larger area where we have a fire protection district, so to speak. Um, but I started as a volunteer. So, you know, I, I wasn't... Didn't go directly to the career fire service, but I did eventually get hired on uh, at the same department, Buchanan, that I, I started volunteering with. Wow. And it's been yeah. really uh, unique, been really unique, uh, been a pretty neat ride. You know, I started, when I was first hired, I was a single firefighter on shift 24 hours and then uh, backed up by about 40 volunteers. So you can imagine that the tide has turned over 17 years and now we're three firefighters per, chief, or per shift, a uh, full-time paid chief and backed up by nine volunteers. So Isn't it we amazing? saw quite the twist and then turn. It's What's amazing, that? right? When you just add like two more people, the difference. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, know, yeah. I know you're, you're supplemented, backed up by volunteers, but um, there's a lot of times where I've, I'd like to be on a, I remember being on, on fires where I wish I was the only guy in the fire truck, right? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but just having that two and then three people, right? The, what you can get done is, is amazing. Yeah, you know, it, it really is. And it that, that shine no more than actually last November, uh, I was involved in a grab that we had. And uh, that we had four that day. And just, just what it allowed us to do with four on that, that, that engine that morning was was pretty huge. But um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to work in a, a good community. We have a very supportive local government, um, pretty tight-knit community. And it's just, it's, it's a good place to work. So the place you work is uh, was established. Buckhannon was established in 1816. So um, named for I can't even pronounce that right. Bunkonga Helles. Bunkonga. Yeah. yeah Bunkonga Helles. Bunkonga Helles. He was the legendary Lenape mm -hmm. Indian chief, uh, which I guess is yep, that uh, is that, um, is that are there still some Indians um, hanging around still in the area? No, nah, not not really. There, there there's a couple statues around that that have, that have pay some homage to that that era, but but nothing nothing really still hanging around. So uh, Buckhannon is at the foothills of the Allegheny Mountains, and like like he said, I I got on Wikipedia that the last census had fifty two ninety nine, so just short of fifty three hundred people. 
which uh, next to that, I, I like to look at the density of, of your of your area, right? I used to work. I used right. to work in a very dense place with eleven thousand people per square mile. Now I'm at sixty five, and you guys are at eighteen ninety three per square mile. So kind of dense, right? Kind of a, um, a little area yep. that's got a bunch of people stack, stacked in it. Yeah, so th- that's what's really neat about our response district. So the uh, the the city limits, which is what you have the uh, the population pulled up for there, is is just a small piece to our district. Uh, we actually cover about fifty four square miles and about thirteen thousand five hundred people, along with majority of the commerce and industry in the county. So mm-hmm. we we go from a really urbanized area with a private four year college, uh, which you got a picture of there in the top right corner of the screen and uh to all the way to very rural areas and remote areas so it's 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 pretty unique response district so you say um the college there what is that west virginia wesleyan yes sir west virginia wesleyan college it's a uh, private four-year college it was established uh by the united methodist conference i'm actually alumnus there (laughs) oh wow good for you um and then i see you're really kind of right in the middle of the state there right a little not really yet north 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 central part of the state, uh, most people are familiar with uh, either Charleston, West Virginia, you know, where Ryan Pennington works at there, he's about an hour and a half south of me. And uh, then, of course, Morgantown, like you referenced with WVU, it's about an hour and 15 minutes north. Hour and 15. Oh, you're closer than I thought. So you're, yep. you're right. Yep. I can yep. definitely get you there before I can get there. Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we um, got some rural stuff. So with that, is that um, the Buckhannon Fire Department, how um, how big, how small, what kind of? Uh... Yeah. So like like I said earlier, we're, we're three per shift, uh, three shifts, uh, run a uh, modified 2448 schedule. And then we have nine volunteers that, that back us up. Very, very good group. I can't talk highly enough of them. Um, very dedicated. Uh, everybody is. But, you know, when I first started in 06, I think we ran 204, I think it's 47 calls. I just looked again the other day because I had a hard time recalling the number. And uh, this we're, we're now approaching 1,300 rather oh, rapidly. Um, you said you yeah, started in 250? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it's ever 17 years, quite the change. Um, part of that's just, you know, society's evolved to the needs and wants of the citizens have as well. But you know, it's we, we only run um, QRS uh, EMS calls inside the city limits. We don't really do that outside of there. So we still run. We, we see our fair share of fire load, um, yeah. usually between 40 and 60 fires a year um, structures. And then uh, total nippers, 100 series is somewhere in the 70s or 80s. Um, but we it's because we don't just run in our area. You know, we being the yeah. only uh, career staff in the county, we uh, we run outside and uh, run automatic aid with five of the other six departments in our county. So you say the the county, uh, and there is mm-hmm. career in the county outside of Buckhannon no. City proper. Mm-mm. I see. No, so, we oh. are we are the only career staff in the entire county. Everybody else is a is a true volunteer department. And then um, EMS, you run EMS calls, right no, inside the uh, city limits. Uh-oh. Yeah, inside the sea limits. No, no, I just got to mute my phone. No transport. You don't have a no, no units. No transport. Um, everything is is just uh, rapid response. We have a uh, private EMS service that comes and does the transports. Gotcha, gotcha. And no EMS outside of the city limits. So um, there yeah. are other. There's other vol- All there's other departments that are all volunteer in the county. Yeah, they're they're all volunteer. Um, they've saw a lot of the same issues, you know, that, that we saw across the nation. Um, what once, whenever I got in, was was six other very healthy uh, volunteer fire departments with large membership has, has shrank um, at least in half by every department, if not more. Yeah. So so the uh, the outline there that would be the county proper, right? And then you guys are kind of the middle. yeah. So that how big is that county? Uh I'm not sure, Tony, off the top of my head. I really am not. I, I think it's 300 and some square okay. miles, but okay. I could be wrong. Okay. And then you guys respond out into the county for help, too. Yeah. Yeah. Our total response district is 54 square miles with uh, around 13,500 people. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it looks like a pretty active department here. You got this. I see you guys in the swift water. So is there, is there a, water, a river or water that runs through the area? 
Yeah, we we have a uh, we have the Buchanan River and the Middle Fork River that that are around us, and the, the Buchanan's right through our response district. Um, we don't see a ton of swift water work. That's actually something new that we're we're getting into just because of proximity to uh, some mutual aid calls. Plus, uh, we we do have a a uh, propensity to flood sometimes, so it's yeah. it's definitely needed. But it's not something we do a lot of. The um... The fire, the Buchanan Fire Department has, I can see you have a tower and you have an engine, I'm sure, right? Yeah, so we have we have three engines um, and then a tower. We also run a, a little F-550 with a squad body on it. Um, and then just a, just a pickup truck for pulling our hazmat trailer and swift water boats or whatever we need to haul around with it. And 40, 40 active volunteers there? No, we used to have at one point when I got in, we had 40 active volunteers and now we have nine on a roster. Oh, so oh. we've definitely saw the decrease in volunteerism. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's tough. That's tough. Everybody's getting. Yeah, our, but our our career staff is uh, very good about coming in. You know, whenever we, we pretty well have an open call out policy for any any call type that has a uh, response force needed greater than three. So. You know, we we have pretty good callback. Actually, we between our nine career staff and our uh, nine volunteers, we'll we'll get typically 12, 11 or twelve people per fire. Wow! Wow! Yeah, that's good. That's a good good response. So let's get right into it then. Let's get into October fifth, uh, twenty twenty one. What um, typical day in October in in West Virginia? It looked like it was. Yes. The pictures looked like it was a beautiful day. It was. It absolutely was. It was a beautiful day, nice day, warm day. Um, it's, it's kind of weird because you know we're doing this podcast. I just returned from Mile High Firefighters Conference, and this was my first shift back from Mile High Firefighters Conference in 2021. And um, you know, just just to kind of backtrack a little bit from the day is uh, the day before whenever I'd flown out. We're not very good in our cadre about taking pictures, and and you know we were staying there that day before we left, and I said, hey, let's get a picture. We never know, you know, whenever one day we we may not be together again or when the next time is we'll actually see each other so we took a picture and then sure enough october 5th 2021 is whenever i had my mayday probably the actually it was the closest call i've had in the fire service um but you know it was was typical monday but the way the call was dispatched wasn't typical tony and that's that's something I like to tell everybody because it kind of puts it into perspective mm-hmm. as to how, you know, you, you have that Swiss cheese model for errors where you fi- start to find holes right, and uh, right, things right. to go wrong. And the dispatch actually came from us calling the fire in over the radio, if I remember right, and maybe some other 911 calls. But somebody ran into our firehouse because this main street is just a block up the street from, from our firehouse. and actually ran into the side door of the firehouse guys were out in the bay i was in my office and uh said that just kind of pointed and said hey there's a fire on main street so i'm sitting in my office and somebody yells into the back and said it basically says the same thing you know we got a structure fire on main street and i'm walking out um kind of trot out to the engine and dispatch hasn't hasn't toned anybody yet i remember looking out the bay there through the bay door that was that was up so that tells you how nice of a day it was and uh, you just see this large black column of smoke uh, uh, funneling over top of the street. So it was pretty obvious we had something that was working. Yeah, that's that's the fire there. Uh, you know, the the building had a couple of storefronts in the in the front. You can you can notice uh, that going down the side street there. So there's the front. So it had a couple storefronts in the front. Um, then it had a couple down that side street too. So you have Main Street in the front. Spring Street on the uh, be the Delta side of, as you're looking at it. That's this and, uh, right the, here. Yeah, the picture there on the far right of the screen that will be the Spring Street side. You can see there's a couple old storefronts that are no longer in use there. Um, I think the total apartments was 12, 12 total apartments over top. Okay, it was uh, two two stories in the front, uh, three in the rear. So it kind of had a split level towards the rear of the building. <laughs> Uh, what's unique about the building, and you can't really see it. Yeah, let's see. Right it's, there's kind of that three stories. Is that? Yeah, that's yeah. That that's that that top right's the three stories, and we'll come back to that picture here in a little bit because that picture will be a good one to explain kind of what happened. Um, but the the building itself was actually built around a house that was constructed in the mid to late 1800s. So there, they had a three story house there, and then they constructed this this type three building around it, hmm. um, which played into some of the, uh, the the fire as far as the fire behavior and everything and how it grew. It actually started in some electrical around that old house. Really? 
newer elect newer electrical, but it, it was in that area. And so the the fire, as you can see, it was it was in the caulk loft. It was in the attic of that old house, and it ran the caulk loft across the building. Um, and so we had we had the dispatch that wasn't really you know we were alerted to the fire a little differently. You know we're we're going up there, so the only the people at that point in time that were truly knew what was going on or that there was a fire was those that were in the building. So that probably put us ahead of everybody else a little more than normal mm -hmm. as far as, you, you know, numbers wise, response wise. Um, and the other, the other really interesting thing, not really interesting, but the other uh, hole in the, we go back, like explained about the Swiss cheese model for errors and premiere with that. But the other domino that kind of fell, so to speak, was our initial line. Um, we stretched a deuce and a half to the second floor and wow. uh, easily start easily started encountering fi encounter fire um firefighter was on the line with me a uh, very good firefighter john bernoli went to open up the line after i uh after i started pulling some ceiling and whatever he did and I actually have this on thermal imaging camera footage is the the fog nozzle we were in the process of switching our lines over to smooth bore uh, low pressure system uh, finally got everybody to see the light and was making that change and the fog tip on that high pressure fog two and a half inch nozzle blew off. So oh, yeah. he's stuck with the play pipe shut off in his hand and the fog tip is just gone. Essentially, it actually blew apart at the end of the nozzle. So we had a nozzle failure on the second floor um, right off the bat. So that was so that was another thing that just back up another, a little bit. Another yeah, Let's sure. Back up. So you're in the firehouse. Let's get back to that. We got in the firehouse, and yeah. how many people did you leave with the, on the fire truck? Just the three of you, or three? Okay. There were three. We we were at two per shift at that time, but we okay. had uh, we had another guy at the firehouse working out. So we, there was three of us on the engine. So yep. when you rolled out, so, you knew you had something going on, and it was in this building. Yep. So uh, yep. you pull up to this building. Obviously, um, well. From the looks of it, though, right? I mean, you couldn't really tell if it was was it was the fire all on the second floor. Did you see fire, or was it just smoke? And where was it coming so, from? Yeah, all the all the uh, everything that we saw was it was heavy black smoke initially, and it was it was coming from that um, be the Bravo Charlie corner as we're looking at it now. Back in the back, um, which is where that yeah, which is, is where that so uh, old house kind of was that situated. One, that middle picture, was yeah, it, that like when you rolled up. Yeah, that, that middle picture right there, that's actually fairly later, I think, looking at the lines on the ground. But that it, you can actually see the old house. If you look between those two buildings, okay. you see the flaming back in there. Okay. That appears to be coming from that old house area. So um, that's what you saw when you got there. So what door did you take to get to get in? Did you? So, yeah, so our fire chief had actually pulled in right, pulled in just a little bit before us. Um, he was a little quicker getting out of the firehouse, obviously, in his pickup truck. And uh, he he told us that it was actually second floor gets at the cock loft area. He he pretty well knew where the fire was, so we didn't have to do a whole lot of looking to figure that out uh, based on his size up. Um, and the door we use for entry, you can see from that picture there, is to the right, um, kind of right before you get to that tree that's that's at the corner. You yeah. see a, a single door that leads that's right it. into the stairwell that goes to the second floor. Okay, between the two. Like on the right side of the, is that a flag there or something that looks like a? Yep. A, yep. So is that that was that takes you to stairs that go to the second floor? Yep, that's directly into the stairwell. Yeah, and and yep. probably put you that's back, what the, put you farther back, anyways, right? It puts you probably at middle the middle of the building. Uh, not quite middle. Um, the stairs were actually they they weren't really long. They were fairly steep, um, but it, it probably a third of the way in, I'd say. Yeah, we, you go up to the top and you're you're right in the hallway and the hallway kind of after about 20 feet makes a left and then a sharp right. So it's two 90 degree turns. But we encountered fire in the you car right at the top of the stairwell. So but yeah. no fire on the it second travel. floor it was all above you. Yeah, at that t at that time, it was all above us. We did have um, as, as we were making that attack and trying to make that push. We did have fire start to uh, come out of the windows there on the Bravo side over top that single story the downtown tattoos building there okay um, so eventually i think i think we go ahead what time was the fire call oh shoot i can't remember now we'd have to pull up your timeline tony okay um it was it was in the morning i can tell you that let's see if yeah, it was, prior to oh, lunch. It was? So this says two o'clock or no no i'm sorry it was, it was after lunch yeah it was just after lunch that's right yeah it was it was two o'clock in the afternoon all right two o'clock 
And then this is a good yep. picture here. Well, I guess you really can't see the house in that picture, but you can see that everything's kind of back in the in that back quad back side of the building, huh? Yes, sir. Okay, so yep. you, you get the top of the steps. You get you see fire above you in the overhead, and um, mm -hmm. it was all traveling in the cockloft. And no fire. So he's he opens the nozzle. The the uh, the stream shaper falls off, and he's just got the the slug with a two and a half. Yep. Two, you two are up there yep. blowing a two and a half in the overhead. Yeah. So it's. Um Whenever I busted, I popped a hole in the ceiling and picked up my camera, it was completely red. So, you know, we're, we were on the FLIR K series. So that's over a thousand degrees in that caulk loft area. And we were, we were in the front of the building. So it had traveled all the way from that, that Bravo Charlie corner throughout the entire caulk loft. Okay. And is that the, is the top right picture? That kind of looks at some of the house that it was built around there in the picture? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's the, uh, the, you can't see the sides of the house. You could only see the uh, the roof portion of it, and that's where those flames are emanating from. That's that's fairly early on in the incident because there eventually was a ladder truck parked where those people are standing. Yeah. All right. So uh, all right. So we're upstairs. You're not. You're trying to knock some fire down. It's not going out. Right. We uh, so we have that that initial line failure. Um, yeah, radioed out that we had a line failure, needed a, a second line stretched as other units were now rolling in. And, you know, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure what had happened, but we ended up getting an inch and three quarter stretched um, rather than a two and a half, another decent half. And um, then they backed that up again with another another inch and three quarter up the same stairwell. So we kind of have two lines that are they're laying on top of each other. The hallway start to get congested. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, from that point, I'm not I'm not really sure. What happened on the hand lines? Because as, as those crews stretched them, we ended up, me and uh, John ended up bouncing off that line and taking a set of irons and trying to clear some apartments. And uh, because we still didn't have a primary ahead. yet. What's that? We were still looking for, Sorry, for a Cody, primary to get all yeah. the occupants. Yeah. Yes. Did, did so you the, find the fire chief ran in? in? So the interesting thing is, is, is as we, uh, as we were flowing that that busted two and a half, um, we actually had a occupant come out of one of the apartments. Now, mind you, the, these doors had already been knocked on. Nobody had forced into them, but but the fire chief had ran ahead and kind of knocked on everybody's doors. Um, and we had somebody come walking out of one of these apartment doors. And this has probably been one of the most enlightening things to me as far as some of the problems we're facing uh, with civilians and fire buildings, especially multiple dwellings as this one is. I remember the guy coming out with headphones on he's totally unaware of anything that's going on and just like turns and looks at us and the the shock on his face that there uh there was a fire in his building yeah, yeah and and this is probably you know four or five minutes into operations that that this happens so yeah wow. it just i think it shows the world to us the world that we're living in to us you know and kind of kind of speaks to our base in their own little world and it creates a different sort of problems for us as far as fire victims being in yeah. buildings yeah yeah i mean yeah that that's crazy so all right so you got him out of an apartment was there anybody else any any other occupants that you had to get out no so so we forced into a couple apartments and uh then there we, we were hearing some talk over the radio as we were getting ready to, to force another one between this time and uh and and but between between kind of in the middle of where we're talking about here we had actually ran or our cylinders were, were getting low on air so we went out to the outside, uh, somebody replaced our cylinders. And uh, one thing I want to point out here, and, and this is not slinging any stones, but it's just something that happened, is as my cylinder was being changed by a mutual aid firefighter, he was having problems making the threaded connection mm -hmm. on my MSA air pack. So he, he turned the cylinder on two separate times and bled air off and then had to turn it back off because the connection wasn't made. And then third time did it again. And fourth time, I'm not, he either finally got it on or somebody helped him get it on. So I, uh, I actually, I don't know how much air was drained from my cylinder, but actually had some air, air drained out. So I really wasn't going in with a full one. Um, yeah, that's tough. As, as we get back inside, yeah, as we get back inside and get to that, that third, we're on the third floor in that rear area. Actually, if you look at the uh, picture on the top left, or top right. I'm sorry. We're um we're on the left hand side there, trying to trying to force entry into those apartments. 
And as, as we're getting the iron set and getting ready to go, we're, we're hearing some talk on the radio about the fire. Um, nobody's really getting the fire in check. And they end up pulling us out of the building. So, so um, all right. So you're you're on the only fire truck from Buckhannon that was there, or did the other other people at, at this at, at this time there was three other three other or three total apparatus. There was a tower um, and two engines, the initial engine and one more. All right. So that that was the guys came in from home and got on yep. there and got out pretty quick. Yeah, you must have a, a pretty good response system if they're able to get in that quick and you guys are still in the primary and they're there. So, okay, so they got, when they got there, they got the second inch and th- or the, the inch and three quarter and they're uh, they're now taking over fire attack and you and John, is it? Yep. yep. Moved, moved to do searching now. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we had, since since they had the line, we kind of bumped up and was doing search. And like I said, between those two, that time frame, we had swapped our cylinders and we ended up getting pulled out. Uh, the, the fire really wasn't being held in check. Nobody nobody was getting to the seat of it. And uh, we we knew that we had three apartments that we hadn't been able to get into. Um, one was on the second floor. Or actually, I'm sorry, two were on the second floor and one was on that third floor. It was the last one that we were getting ready to force into. Um so you know that that doesn't leave a good feeling okay. in your stomach, and in the heat of in the heat of the moment, <laughs> you know you're you're kind of frustrated, yeah. and so at well, that point, because you we're out. I think that we forget, right? That uh, again, I I was uh, I did 29 years in a in a city that I didn't live in, right? So I mean, right. I, you know, obviously I had some I had some dogs in a fight, but it not like but there, I mean, that's those are your those are you grew up with all these people, right? And uh, Right. And and yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's a certain, there's an extra like layer of, uh, of responsibility. You're like, you know, fish and yeah, I can imagine the stress is like, we need to get in there and you probably even know who lives in the apartments. Right. And so let's get in there. Right. Yeah. No, I I understand. So, okay. So you're, you got pulled out, but there's still three places you need to get into for a primary. Right. So they, they, after a little bit of discussion, they, they said, well, throw some ladders to the windows. Let, we'll let you guys go in that way and search those apartments and, and get out of there. And I, that, that's what I ended up doing. Now, um, one thing I'll, 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 I'll want to point out because it really plays into things later is remember I had already changed out one cylinder um, when it went in for a short time for some operations, um, came back out and did not change cylinders again. So I just kind of unclipped my air and, and we threw one ladder, uh, my bro- as actually my brother and I did. It's uh, it's not not in any of your pictures, but made entry into that. I was the first one up, made entry into that room. It quickly realized it was like a being used as a storage room for their tools and construction materials as, as they remodeled apartments. That just was kind of their staging area for that stuff. Um, so that one was really quick, um, came back down. Then uh, you'll see in your picture there on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, that's actually my brother going into that room and uh, me button the ladder and the other white hat there. And then uh, firefighter Maria Potter is getting ready to go up the ladder. And they, they went in quickly cleared that apartment. Um, nobody's search was negative. Um, but I remember one of the interesting things and it plays into, into what happened to me is I remember watching Maria try to come out and uh, she's tall. Like she's tall. She's six foot two, probably um, I'm six, four. And she was having a little bit of problems fitting through the window. Now, as you can see, wow. They did not take that whole window. They had only taken the bottom half, um, which which probably caused them some issues. But she just with her long legs and everything and trying to come back out, it was a little bit more difficult coming out of that room than it was going in. Um, the windows, whenever I went back later on and, and measured them, I think they were 18 inches wide wow. at the uh, at the bottom. Yes, yeah, so they were a little narrow. And then you, you get to talking you, you know, brick construction as you figure the width of the brick. Um, made that step a little long and a little, a little narrow for a big guy like me. I'm six four to probably two sixty, two fifty at this at this time. Um, so I'm not a small guy. So after it, going back to that picture in the bottom right hand corner, you know, you see the other ladder being thrown on the uh, Bravo side of the structure there at uh, Spring Street. So I'm watching the the ladder getting thrown, and um, it's it's going up, but it's not going up smooth, and I'm I'm kind of getting a little bit impatient just watching them. Um, and uh, they they get it thrown. We get out of this this other room over this other apartment over here, and we walk over just to just to see if they need help. Kind of butt their ladder as they go up because we knew that was the last one. And I remember watching the firefighters trying to mask up at the bottom of the ladder, and their hands shaking. 
And um, it was it was taking a little taking a little long. I was probably growing a little impatient. Um, probably need to check my ego a little bit, just to be quite honest with you. And uh, so I just I just went went up the ladder. I was like, I'll just I'll just take care of it. Grabbed the hook and and went up the ladder and cleared the window. Went in and ended up being an empty apartment. Not absolutely no furniture, no nothing. Like completely vacant apartment. So very easy, very yeah. easy primary at that point. Yeah. So, you so any questions are, up to that point? I mean, we're, we're, kinda... we're looking at the back here, right? Because that's that's the that window yeah. is uh, on the other side of the white car here. Those, those are the the apartments in the rear that you still needed to clear. Yeah. So the uh, the window that I just went into would be on the uh, the Delta side. So it's oh. um, in the in that apartment, that far left third third floor window is is the apartment. Okay. That uh, that I'm in. Okay. So from that from that point until me coming out of the structure is just a little bit over four minutes, and that was basically the the time of the length of my mayday. Um, you know the uh, the very the very poor choices that I made looking back and they were made out of being task saturated and um, kind of wanting to get things done, so to speak, is that, you know, I pointed out that I didn't, didn't change my cylinder. Why didn't check my air supply? So whenever I went in that third floor window, just out of habit, you know, I take the window, I clip my regulator in, go on air, really probably didn't need to be in or on air at that point in that structure because it was completely clean, no smoke, you know, we didn't have any holes opened up in the ceiling. It was just out of habit. But the other thing that I didn't even realize it was caught by my brother and a couple others on the outside is that my audio alarm was going off. So from the minute I entered the window, I was actually already in my last portion of air. It was enough to enough to set the audio alarm off. Yeah. But because I was so task saturated and just just so many other noises, I didn't even realize it was me. Uh, honestly, I didn't. Um come back to the window after just walking through the apartment and uh, the uh, second firefighter had actually just came in and um, I told him, I said, it's completely empty. It's vacant. So I go to go back out the, uh, the window and I always, you know, always go in head first whenever I, whenever I go through a window off the ladder, that's just typically how I, how I operate. Whenever I went to go back out, I always step out feet first. Well, if you, Look at your profile, especially a rather large guy like me. I'm a lot narrower going through that window head first with yeah. my arms out than I am turning sideways with an SCBA on. So I, I try to step out once. I have some issues, actually a lot of issues. The first time I couldn't even really get out over the, the width of the windowsill. And um, went to go again and uh, got got out, thought I was going to get out on it, and I couldn't get – my uh, my second leg up and through the window and the uh, bottom of the SCBA cylinder kept hitting. So now, mind you, the whole time that I've been in this building, I've kind of built this this mental image in my house in my head that we could see. You know, even when we were outside or outside this apartment, whenever they pulled us out, we could see each other. We were on air, but it was mostly just because of of every once in a while you get some smoke coming back down from that cock loft or, or some flames licking down. I mean, we really probably truly didn't need to be on air all the time. Um, so whenever I had problems coming out the window, I remember coming back in that second time looking out and I'm like, I, I can bail out, but in my mind, there's no reason to because I've walked all over this building and had zero issues. So he and I go over to the apartment door. The door is actually screwed shut. It had a, a skeleton key lock on it, so you couldn't even unlock. Couldn't unlock it if it was just locked. But going back later, the door actually had three or four screws in it. It was screwed shut. Um, did not have the proper tools to force the door. For uh, just how, however, it happened. I don't. I don't know if he picked up a uh, just a, a random tool sitting at the butt of the ladder, but he ended up with a pickhead axe, and I had a six foot New York hook. So you know, the, the the tool selection at that point for the what we were faced with really wasn't the best. I tried to get my New York hook in the door and force it, and uh, just being six foot and what the space we were working with around the door, it didn't work. So we ended up going through a window that was adjacent to that door to get in the hallway. And looking back now, I should have I should have noticed it was a lot darker in that hallway whenever we took that window than what it was when I was out there. And because uh, whenever he dropped through, he yelled back and he said, hey, it's a little farther drop than what you think. And um, 
So I drop out and it's it's pitch black. The hallway smoke filled, and uh, there's another picture. I wish I wish I would have sent you, but you can actually see that bottom that lower right hand picture. It looks like a beautiful day, right? Yeah, it looks beautiful. The second picture is me going up the ladder, and you can barely make me out on the ladder because how much wind has started to push in and push all the smoke back down around the building. So whenever it did that, it started pushing the smoke into that second and third floor area to where you, visibility was so, completely, completely zero. So you're saying the apartment had a door to get out to the hallway, but there was also a window right. next to that. Was yep. it like a, there, there, like was, a, there was a, like a, a regular window with a sash and, Really? Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And now keep in mind, this building had been added on right. to a few times throughout history. So it's probably probably why it was there. Just never been enclosed. Yet. Probably part of the old house um, that was built or something. It could, it could. I don't think it's part of the old house, but it was probably one of the uh, first. The If I had to guess at some point, it was probably an exterior wall. I, I don't oh. know if they had built onto it from there. All right. So you get over you get out over the out the window into the hallway and it's full of smoke. Yep. Yeah, complete zero visibility. Um, the, one of the first things after we both get dinner that I hear him say is, I can't find the stairwell. Um, we had both kind of, I think, in our, our heads thought that we would come out of that window or that apartment and the stairs would be immediately right in front of us. Um, but because we were up on that third floor, there was kind of a little balcony area that was built that, that went out over top the stairs. And um, that's where we had landed outside that window. So he was feeling he was feeling the uh, the the balusters in the handrail and things like that. And realized that that he was kind of in the wrong direction and came back to me. And your low air alarm at that was time, going off. Yep, yeah, yeah, low air alarm was going off. I actually, I skipped a part there when I was telling you wherever I, that second time um, that I tried going through the window, I realized that's whenever I realized that my low air my audio alarm was going off. My low air alarm was going off. So then you went um, through that apartment, get to the door. Now you're out in the hallway. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah. We'll try. So, you know, again, bad, deci bad decisions um, because because I knew at that point that my low air alarm was going off. But in my head, this building was there was no smoke in the, in the rest yeah. of this building. Everything was above us. So I thought I'm just going to walk out, walk out here and, and walk down the stairwell and be fine. And um, the minute we, we went through that window and it got zero visibility, I realized that you know, we'd, we we we'd probably made a little bit of a mistake. Um, especially mm. myself with my air supply. The other, the other boy had a uh, had a full cylinder, and you know he's he. Whenever we met there on that balcony, I kind of going to your training tip for the month. Uh, that's whenever I scanned with my thermal imaging camera. Okay. Um, and he told me he couldn't couldn't find the stairs, and in the recording, and I'll gladly share the recording with you. Um, you can see the apartment door that we tried coming through on the left, and then you can see another apartment door at the end of the hallway, and then. If you look real closely, you can see about three horizontal lines in the screen. Now, Tony, I mean, you you know how much I've used a thermal imaging yeah. camera. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot, right? Well, I, I've showed this in classes on big screen TVs and only half the class see the stairway, the, see the stairwell, because they are just real, real fine vertical or horizontal lines. And if, if you haven't used a camera enough looking and, and, and interpreting that that image on that screen they're very easy to miss sometimes at those angles um i was lucky uh that my department believes in thermal imaging a lot mm -hmm. and we have a lot of decision making cameras we don't really use situational awareness cameras so we have that 320 by 240 resolution yeah i don't believe i don't believe if i would have had a situational awareness camera with a 160 by 120 that I would have saw those stairwells because yeah. there just would not be enough detail in the image. So, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of the first tip I, I, I kind of want to make sure everybody understands is that resolution matters <laughs> very, very, very big when you're trying to pick out certain objects within the building. All right, we'll keep, um, we'll keep write that down or keep that because at the end of this, I'm going to ask you like three things that you want to, you want to pass on. So we'll, we'll say resolution matters, but go ahead. Yeah. So from we found the stair, we we found the stairs there, um, and I had I just we didn't spend a lot of time in this building. We didn't run a lot of med calls there. Didn't have a lot of calls there, so I wasn't overly intimately familiar with this building. Like, and if we were, we came in through the, the main street uh, that that stairwell that we entered in with the hose line, and we weren't really in the rear half of the building, which is where I am now. I'm trying to find my way out. 
So we hit those stairs. Uh, we go down a few stairs, landing, go down a few stairs more. And I'm, I'm ahead of him. And I, I believe I'd, I'd have to ask him to be 100 percent sure. I, I probably should know this, but between us leaving the top of the stairs and going down those stairs, he called a mayday. Um, and, and kudos to him for that, because I had actually tried radioing out one time whenever we first dropped out of the window and could not get my radio to, to connect. It just it, it kept getting the, uh, the the tone where it wasn't connecting to the tower. Um, so he called the Mayday, gets, does a really good job calling the Mayday. It's, it's Ethan Smith's his name. He did, did a fantastic job with that. Um, it's recognized, but not initially made out by command. Um, I don't, the, uh, radio recording, he, he actually has him repeat the mayday so that, yeah. so that he can pick up all the information. Uh, my brother and uh, firefighter John Bernoulli, who were outside had actually tried to come up the stairwell and were met by the smoke, um, and heat from that, from, from that, uh, that spring street side. And it actually relayed to command just prior to that, that, that they believe that we had a firefighter missing on low air. So there were there was more than one person on scene that realized the issue that had kind of transpired at that point. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, and, and I'm, I get goosebumps every time I get to this point in the story because I was ahead of him, and I was I was feeling for the other set of stairs to to get us down to the uh, the first floor from the second, and couldn't find them. And in my mind, they should have been right there. I mean, right right near me. And I it kind of laid out and I felt I felt that I was in a T-shaped hallway. You know, there was another another hallway that hit this one perpendicular. And I remember setting up on my knees and hearing that that low air alarm, that audio alarm. If you're familiar with the bell on the MSA, you know, the lower your air gets, the, ding, the longer that ding, that. Ding. Yeah. So I literally was to the point that it was tink and nothing. And then it would hit again. And, you know, if you I've always been fascinated by the body's stress response or response to stress. And, you know, everybody you hear about um, the exclusion of auditory signals. Well, then you have the intensification of auditory signals. And it's usually whenever a person feels hopeless and they cue in on one and it's, mm. it'll be the loudest noise you ever hear in your life, because that's what that audio alarm sounded to me. I just remember that that striking of that bell and a long pause. And I actually remember my, my face piece hitting between my knees in the hallway. Cause I thought I wasn't seeing any of my family again. I, I really thought at that moment that I wasn't, I wasn't coming out of this building. Um, probably the most helpless feeling I've ever felt in my life. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I can only imagine. So especially a building that you thought was uh, clear at times, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, that, that my mental image of the building did not match what was actually transpiring. And, you know, you study, you study any, or look at any, um, any cl near misses. That's, that's one common theme. I don't care if it's in the fire service or, you know, somebody that's out rock climbing or hiking or rafting, you know, what they think is transpiring and what actually is transpiring are generally two different things. Yeah. And that was very much true for my situation. Uh, my situation awareness, as far as that was, was pretty well gone. Um, and I remember in that moment, you know, head between my knees, I kind of set up and I take a deep breath and, and, you know, to hear Ethan talk, he said, you know, you, your breathing was calm the whole time. He said, like you, you were box breathing, you know, it was, it was like, you realized what was going on. And, and because we had trained on air management, you were, you were incorporating some of those things just automatically. Um, but I remember, I remember thinking in my head is it's kind of like you, you dummy, if you're, if you're going to get out of this, you got to help yourself. Um, so I set up and I just looked around once cause you know, we always, I talk about look optically with your eyes before you pick the camera up and look with it because the brightness from the screen is going to impact your, your optical vision. And, uh, I just kind of look behind me and I see a real thin streak of light, um, coming from a wall area and I, it just connected immediately if that was a window. And, uh, so I, I grabbed, um, grabbed Ethan's shoulder and kind of basically threw him towards it and said, window, take it. And I wasn't sure where the window was going to lead. So I positioned myself in a, up against the wall and I'd already had my SCBA off and hand on the, the wheel of my SCBA. I was ready to start wheel breathing um, just in case it didn't, didn't get us out of the situation. And uh, whenever 
I don't know if you can go back to those other pictures you had. Yeah. There just a minute ago. So the uh, the window I ended up coming out of, go to the one you were just on, you were there. The window I ended up coming out of, if you see the two guys standing in the parking lot, the one on the right-hand side, there's a little red roof uh-huh. above his helmet. The window right there is the one that I ended up coming out the of. The one right below the fire. <laughs> yep. Yep. So I had came from that top left window all the way across to to that window um, on my low air alarm. Mm. And uh, they ended up, this they were able to get a ground ladder some, up to the right, me. To the right, just to the right of this uh, balcony yeah. here. Huh? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That, that balcony, you know, that, that it, there's a little piece in there that I, that I kind of skipped over, but that balcony, we had actually opened up the door to it once. And, but we knew from walking, walking the main street, we, we walk up and get ice cream a lot on main street. So on the way back, we'd walk around different buildings and we had looked at those balconies previously and they really were not in great shape. Yeah. Um, you could actually see the boards pulling apart and we knew we really never wanted to be on them as far as fire ground operations. And there's a bunch of wires. You can't even get a ground ladder into them. So we just immediately closed that door because we knew that they were, they were so bad and uh, never even thought about just, just taking some sort of um, staging there until, until I could either get another cylinder or they could get something up to get off of us. You know, it's just, I'll be the first to admit there was a lot of, a lot of poor decisions on my part in this. And uh, that would be one of them also. You know, in hindsight, you can think a lot clearer. So, uh, so okay. So you yep. you got to this window, and you got to this window, and and you busted out. Ethan busted it out. Yep, Ethan took it with took it with the axe that he had. Yeah, and uh, then I I put my head through it first. I mean, just <laughs> just to see if there was anybody else down there and take a look around. And I I, I saw some. So actually, it was a chief from uh, Weston Fire Department was standing back beside their truck because their tire was was positioned there at that time and. He ended up throwing me a, a a ground ladder to get off that roof, but you know, whenever I took my mask off, my it was sucking to my face. I mean, it was it was it was starting to starting to collapse in on me. I was completely out of air, and I I pretty much just ripped it off with my head through that window, and uh, and crawled out on that roof to be able to climb down. So um, you never gave a mayday call. Ethan gave the call. Ethan gave the mayday call. I tried radioing out one time from that after we dropped out of that window and just my, my radio, it's a digital system. It needs to connect with the tower and my radio. And for, I, I'd say just because of the positioning I was in, never, never connected with the tower. Um, between that point and me getting to that, that T shape in the hallway, he had actually called my mayday. Was there any communication? I remember, I, go ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead. I remember him. Yes. I remember him uh, telling me whenever we got down there that he had he had radioed the Mayday. So I'm not it was between those two points. I'm not 100 percent sure at what point it was. Was there any communication between outside people and Ethan after the Mayday was called? No, uh, he uh, he repeated back what what he said. But she and, said- and that's the Yeah, the, well, the chief, the chief had him repeat it and he. The chief copied it back to him, and then uh, they they had sent a writ team around yeah. to the uh, to to actually. I think they part of them went in that stairwell because they split, and then part of them went to the rear of the building to throw ladders. And before they got around there was whenever we we found that window. The whole the whole episode it takes me longer to tell a story. The whole episode was four minutes long. <laughs> it felt like an eternity in there, but the whole episode was four minutes yeah. long. Four minutes from the time where he said Mayday until you guys had got out the window. Four minutes from me going back in the window, not being able oh, to. wow. Okay. You feel to, to the time I came out, out that window. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm sure it did feel like uh, an eternity as you were listening to that bell um, slowly uh, dinging. So. So, um, yeah. All right. So the, this is the timeline after this, of course, the, the, um, uh, the, the community was, um, was really, you know, had been rocked by this, uh, one, because it was a downtown building, right. A building in the main street area and uh, three alarm fire, big fire for the area, but also because one of their firefighters had been hurt. So that the fire chief, mm-hmm. uh, this was on, um, he released the letter addressing that and he put this timeline out and you can see that at, at really 1433, right, right after that was when command orders and evacuation, like he talked about, and then mm-hmm. there was still um, 
This is when when uh, when Joey mentioned about the three apartments that had still needed to be be searched. You can see that that timeline in between 1433 and, and 1456. So we know that a couple of places, a couple of apartments had been searched before the 1456. And he estimates that at 1452 is when you went right. in to um, mm -hmm. that last apartment and then everything transpired. So uh, again, I'm glad, yep. glad, uh, glad it, it, that um, everything worked out. Um, you say uh, the RIT team. So the, obviously you had enough people there. The chief had enough people there to assemble a standby rescue team. So I wouldn't say that they were already being labeled RIT. Um, gotcha. You know, I'll tell you one of the biggest learning points that looking back that I've had, and I think a lot of the others have had, is that we are so used to fighting residential fires. We, we have a good fire load for a community our size that whenever we're confronted with a building like this, that we, we kind of take some things for granted. And, you know, a lot of times we have the fire in check and out before the reinforcements arrive to establish a writ team. So there really wasn't a dedicated writ is my understanding, but there were enough people there that he was able to very quickly grab some people and say, Hey, you know, I need you. we got a mayday in the rear and, and there were some good guys, but you know, we, we also battle the, uh, you know, you, you get a lot of volunteer fire department, rural volunteer fire departments that don't even have the ability to see this in their first due mm. um, coming to this fire. And I think that that played a lot into it, too. You know, yeah. we kind of had a residential mindset and, ha and, and have learned from that since. And uh, they really did, because this this would not be something they would typically face. And, and not just residential, but residential single family one story right yeah yeah right yeah. well one and two story but yeah, right. yeah 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 so you 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 do some things that you normally wouldn't do or you do some things that you shouldn't do in these buildings because that's typically what you face and and i think we've done a good job at, at uh at realizing that and, and and altering some of our operations and training to make up for it probably still have a ways to go but you know we've we've learned from it yes yeah good so um Speaking of that, so um, all right, so you're you're here. Um, and was there any injuries? Were you was uh, there any need for transport? Or no. So, so, but I, I will throw out this word of caution. So, and I'm, I'm very open about this. Um, from this incident, I started to have a lot of PTSD issues. Um, some of them um, really surprised me, so to speak. But it's very very typical from some other friends that have battled some of the same things. Um, it kind of opened up a treasure trove of incidents and things that had happened in my past that I buried. Um, so it was really, it was a really difficult time for me. But, you know, one of the things that, that we have learned as an organization that I try to tell everybody else in our state, and I don't know how, how prevalent it is outside of here, but if you're not transported um, in this type of situation as a firefighter in the state of West Virginia, workers' comp does not cover anything for mental health. So I, I signed off. I had no to it, as far as I, I was concerned, I was uninjured um, physically. I was uninjured. Yeah. Mentally, I was very injured. Um, and, and, you know, I remember kind of sitting by myself part of that part of the rest of the operations and and uh, just what never really was myself after that. Yeah. So, you know, that was that's been one big one big learning point for me. All right. So Ethan uh, did not run out of air. He had enough air. No. Yeah, he uh, I think he started actually with a full cylinder whenever whenever we started this started that search. He, he was actually at a full cylinder. Uh, so he had no issue because, you know, we're just putting crews together to make these searches happen, um, which, again, that residential mindset and not used to lengthy operations. You know, you have somebody that I'm through two cylinders now whenever that low air alarm is going off and uh, he's just starting his first. Oh, OK. He was just he had just gotten there, too. I got you. Yeah. So uh, obviously, big fire for, for the town. Um, I know when research that looks like they tore the building down after uh, yes. after the fire it was uh, a fire after you guys got out. There was still a lot of firefighting still needed to be done. Uh, yeah, they ended up they ended up actually just going straight to the uh, the elevated master streams on the three towers and uh, and pretty well just extinguishing the rest of the fire that way. All right. Well, I'm glad uh, I'm glad you're here to, to be able to talk about that. And and um, 
and and what you know what you've done and, and will, willing to give back and talk about it again so so um i like i said i like to ask people if there's three things two or three things or whatever you have if you have more that you want people to take from your um incident you're obviously sometimes it's a sacrifice uh, from your from your uh incident that you had two or three things yeah so the first would just be train on air management. I know you, you said you touched on that on, on the last May Day Monday, but it is so important. Um, it, it, I, I, I really did not have to think about those things once I realized that my low air alarm was going off. The, the things that I did were almost automatic. You know, the box breathing. I wonder he went to take the window, just just automatically slinging that pack off my back between my legs, ready to wheel breathe. Um, they just they just happened. It wasn't wasn't something that I had to think about. Um, with that, I, I would say that, you know, in in certain other instances in reading line of duty death reports and things, you know, you hear about people taking their mask off as that air got low, that urge was there. I mean, I, I, I that was a conscious thought. It was it was don't don't take your mask off. Don't, don't just don't do that. So, you know, it adds a little bit of a different perspective to that. Um, second thing would go back to the camera. You know, that, that's that's all again. That's automatic for me because I teach it all the time. Yeah. We use thermal imaging cameras very heavily in our department. Um, it is a force multiplier for us. You know, being able to get that vision back, um, putting people on target as far as size ups, uh, knowing how to properly use it, but also that we haven't skimped on that technology. You know, there there was a race to the bottom, so to speak, among manufacturers with thermal imaging cameras over the last decade, where make them cheap, make them small, so that everybody can have one. Well, if I if we had sacrificed that that 320 by 240 sensor for a 160 by 120, I probably would have never saw those stair treads. And who knows how that would have changed the outcome? Uh, we definitely would not have been able to go right to them and, and go down them because just moving from that third floor to the second floor is what allowed us to get below the smoke just enough to see that light through that window. So that was. That that that's a big piece that I think a lot of people miss when it comes to thermal imaging cameras is what you're sacrificing whenever you give up that sensor technology. Um, that's lastly is that's is, is, is that's that's uh, really a tough one. Like you say, uh, um, you know, I, I I see like the they they've added right NFPA an NFPA approved camera or an NFPA certified camera, and you know we know right. that that adds so much more money right dollar dollar amount to a camera yeah but it meets a certain standard right so there's a there's a good reason for that i guess because i i again i bought my own little 500 hundred dollar right uh flair or the um um what's the little camera that everybody's carrying seek the seek the little orange one the seek. first, the yep. first version of that right and it was cheap really cheap very right. cool but you're but then i realized wow this is a situational awareness camera this is not a decision making. Right. Camera. And, um, you know, now when I go to when I was at uh, in a company officer, I'm like, oh, I, I can't sacrifice the big camera for this little thing here because that big camera does do so much more. Uh, but it's a fine yeah. line. So, so but, you know, we, we saw all those other cameras manufactured. I actually have one sitting here beside me that I wanted to, I wanted to show you. So and I hope this is where we're going to go as a, as a whole fire service with equipment manufacturers. I, I don't know that, but. This is this is Seek's basically a replacement for the Fire Pro X. Um, they have another one out that's got a, a, a little bit less quality sensor, or as far as resolution, so to speak. Um, but this is a thousand dollars, and it has the exact same sensor in it as their larger FireTac Pro camera that's NFPA certified. So you're not sacrificing much now with what's what's coming out on the market. Um, to make those purchases. Yeah. I mean, I understand everybody's under a financial financial strain and, and sometimes you got to make decisions based off that. But it's my hope that as a uh, as a, a fire service that we're going to start to see better cameras in that price range. Well, so, OK, so we got um, uh, the, the, another th you were going to say a third thing there when I when I stopped and, and, and got focused on a camera. Yeah. So and just the third thing is just just kind of hit three different points. And I'm sure we'll come back to the thermal imaging camera here in a minute. But um, just be be ready for the mental health emergency whenever somebody has experienced this and not not just that person, but how it's going to affect your your entire department. You know, I can I can remember some of our other firefighters making comments about, well, man, if that, if that can happen to you, you know, how would I have reacted? You know, I mean, that's 
uh, because some of them see me as being able to travel around and teach. And that does, I don't put myself on a pedestal for that, but you know, they, they, they start to look at that. Well, if you can find yourself in that situation, how would I have reacted? So I think that um, we're probably very underprepared as a fire service and uh, to, to deal with the, uh, the, the mental aspects of near misses, not just line of duty deaths, but near misses and close calls. Yeah, no, and, that, and that's a good that's a good thing, right? I didn't I didn't um, anticipate that part of you bringing that to the web to the podcast too. Um, you know, I figured uh, thermal imaging camera um, again, situational awareness thing, and then uh, the mental awareness stuff. The mental mental health aspect is is big, and um, we have to we have to be prepared for that too, right? It's it's a it's a whole body a whole wellness kind of thing, not just uh, physical fitness and yes, sir. And physical health, but it's mental health too. No, thank you, and that that's good yeah. stuff. And I really appreciate um, you talking about it. Um, it. It's rare, right, that that um, people will will kind of put themselves out and say, "Hey, I'll talk about this." Um, but but um, you know, you know, from going around, the value of being able to speak about these things because um, there's not a lot of this going on, you know, in the fire service where we're we're kind of doing after action reports on our on our incident. So thank you, yeah. Tony. Yeah, Tony. You know, one of the things that makes it has, that has happened to me in my career through teaching that that really has given me the courage to stand up for that is, is uh, Chief Starnes and I were teaching a class here in West Virginia. And um, several months later, somebody in that class uh, ended up committing suicide. And uh, ever since then, you know, it's it, it's really shined a light on me that, hey, it's something we need to talk about, that there was no indications that that was going to happen with that person. And uh, it, it's it's fairly humbling, you know, to, to realize where we're at as far as being prepared for to provide the resources to our members um, to be able to Im improve their mental health and make sure that we're taking care of their health holistically, as you said, not just the physical. And and I, I just I wanted I thank you for I thank you for reinforcing the air management stuff too. And I think a lot of people, you know. Um, they're, they're, it's tough to say, hey, let's go walk on a treadmill today, right? And let's go breathe our bottles down or, or let's go let's go practice this. Remember last time we didn't do that? Well, this time I want you to do this box breathing thing. But uh, like I mentioned earlier in uh, in wrapping up or repeating last month when we talked to the Wilmington, Delaware firefighters, one of the uh, firefighters was trapped in the basement and he remembered, he remembered from his training, his whole, controlling his breathing. Right. And then and then here you are again talking about that. And um, we did. We talked about box breathing in last month's May Day. So so please, guys, um, it, it, it may sound weird. And, and I know I've been reading a book. I don't know if you've seen that book called Breath. And um, it's about the science of breathing. And one of the things I find myself doing is sitting there and practicing this, you know, four in, four hold, four out. And, and just just to get that and take advantage of of your downtime to work on a really important skill, which is breathing. So so thank you. And Mark, can you put the slides back up? So let's talk about this. Uh, good stuff on the on the close call. Um, and one of the things you mentioned is training and uh uh, I yep. had you on here. I really reached out to you for training stuff. And then lo and behold, you brought along a close call where we could talk about. But like I mentioned earlier on is uh, in the this month's Mayday Monday posting, uh, the touch on a line of duty death in Baltimore that happened in the early 2000s. And uh, one of the recommendations that came out of that was that firefighters, the thermal imaging camera is a great tool that can enhance what we do. And firefighters need to need to be properly trained on its use. Well, what does proper training mean? Um, I know from my upbringing, uh, when, especially when we bought a camera, we would get the, the manufacturer would come out and say, here's how you turn it on and here's how you turn it off and here's how you change the battery and here. Right. And that's about as far as yep. the, the, the training went. Uh, fortunately, I've been involved with some fire departments that have not set not settled for that. And uh, we had some early companies uh, come in and do some thermal imaging cl classes, live fire stuff. It was great. Right. Really good. And unfortunately, right, that uh, seems to be kind of few and far between um, as uh, technology increased and the departments got new stuff. Um, we want to make sure we can find some proper training. 
training. But a lot of people, I think, proper training think that it, it is this crazy live fire and you got to do all these things. You got to set up your burn building. And then that, that gets in the way of doing any training. Well, I think it can be pretty basic. And I learned this from Joey and his friends at Insight earlier this year when I attended a class in Stafford of of Virginia, another another local Virginia fire department. And uh, they had their, they had uh, contracted with uh, Insight and they came out and did some stuff one of the one of the basic skills basic drills that he did was they took a they took chalk and they drew a a box a couple boxes on the ground and um they said we're going to do some thermal imaging training i'm like are you kidding me this is what this is what we're getting is a a box on the ground but then we walk through the steps and one of the things i learned was the scan um it's not just about you know, using the camera. It's about learning the steps to go through. And Joey, can you talk a little bit about, about the scan and, and what, what it entails? Yeah. So, and just, just to add on to what you said, the reason why we, we call it our chalk talk, drawing that, drawing that outline of the, the house out. And, and, and a couple of reasons for that is number one, we can actually walk through the movements of, of performing a primary and showing people when to scan and when to put the camera down because it, it's, it's, a force multiplier. It doesn't replace basic skills, but, uh, you know, just, just to use the outline you have drawn there, you know, if I'm going to scan one of those rooms, the very first thing I tell everybody is you need to make sure you get inside that room, because if I'm outside that doorway, I'm narrowing the area that I have to look at. I can't, can't quite see the whole room from wall to wall because I'm, 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 my point of view is not great. So as you go through the format life fire layout, where you get down, look optically, feel around, and when you come back up, pick the camera up and start your scan low. Wipe the lens is a good habit to get into between there. As you're picking that camera up, wipe the front of the camera to make sure there's no moisture on it and uh, start that scan low. The reason why we start that scan low is because that's where life and layout is. You know, we were kind of getting the layout of the building. You know, for me, it was the stairs. I instantly started scanning low. So I saw the stairs that were on plane there in, in the lower half of the my field of view. And uh, then, you know, that if, if we're looking for, for people, you know, we're looking for the furniture that they may be around. You're not always going to see somebody inside there with the camera. Actually, we don't clear rooms with the camera, we clear rooms with our hands. But it might put us on target as far as where, where we're going to go, such as a bed or a couch. Um, but we move low to high. You know, I tell everybody it's low shoulder to shoulder and then look high shoulder to shoulder. And then if you've came from somewhere else, it's always a good habit to look back behind you. So... The, uh, the low, we did, and we didn't used to always teach that. You know, we used to teach firefighters to look high first. You know, the six-sided scan was, was kind of what it was called whenever it was first being taught. You, you started high. Well, if you use a thermal imaging camera and you've, you've been trained on it, you'll know that most cameras on the market operate in two modes, temperature modes, high sensitivity and low sensitivity. And whenever we put that camera up, we run the risk of seeing the heat, the camera adjusts to low sensitivity, which I like to explain it. It's like putting on a pair of sunglasses. We put on sunglasses to keep the light from getting to our retinas and, and where your eyes constrict to restrict some of that light from getting to your retinas to not damage your eyes. But when I put on those sunglasses to, to darken everything down, I lose detail in the colder areas. So I take my sunglasses off. I can see better in the darker areas and it hurts me to look at the bright light. The camera's doing the same thing, you know, as you, as you pick it up and you point it towards heat, it is basically putting on a pair of sunglasses. It's going to low sensitivity and it's keeping some of that heat energy from from getting to the sensor so that it can see better in that area. But the trade off is in those colder areas, I'm not seeing as well. So that's why we scan low first, because that's where the colder area is going to be. It's going to allow me to see life and layout. And then I'll scan high where the heat is probably going to be accumulated. And I'll, I'll be looking for thermal severity and convection currents as far as where the, 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 the seat of the fire may be. I, I really think I like what you said, too, about um, getting low, because if I'm on my knee, right, if I'm on my knee and I'm kind of upright, like you said, it, it, that camera might be right there in that in that uh, layer where it's just going to get moisture and, and crap on the lens. And I've I've I've, yes. I've just reduced the ability for that camera to see. So, yeah, get down low, right? Because people are, might be laying on the floor anyways. That's typically right where they're they're walking out of the right. they fall down. They're on the floor. So, and you do that without the camera first, 
I mean, you, uh, like you said, you adjust, yeah. right? You get it without the camera yep. and then you can use your camera. Right. Yeah. It's it. We're not replacing anything else. You know, we've, we've always been taught, you know, look optically, look for the smoke travel, get below that smoke layer, look to see what you could see, do that before you scan with the camera. We're not replacing any basic skills. We're just, we're just adding more information onto it. I, and I, again, like you mentioned, the, the cameras, the technology has gotten so much better, but there, it's still not as good as the human eye. Right. I mean, right. And right. Yeah. Know, if, 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 if Go ahead. If you can see, if you can see optically, you know, there's, there's, especially in that lower portion of the room, I don't, I don't really need a, a camera to scan and see that, right? If I've got, if it's, a, if the room is 12 feet deep and I've got 12 feet of vision, that, that's great. Now, whenever our vision starts to get obscured, that's, that's whenever we definitely need to be using that camera to scan the room. And uh, we really need to be using it to, to look for convection currents and, and thermal severity up high, to, especially if we're if the fire has not been located or not been kept in check yet. And, and then also I go back to that not as good as the human eye. And you know that if you turn your head around, if you if you turn your head really fast, you have to stop for a second and focus on something. Yeah. So you do the same thing with a camera. And I see a lot of guys you know, in the, in the real world. Right. They'll take that camera and they'll move it around like it's like it's catching mm -hmm. like it's it's refreshing that quick. Well, again. Right. Uh, yeah. It's not. So give it a second. And, and as much as we hate to to say slow down slow down right and take yep. take the time to get a good scan and and um and that will help you and yes well, sir that so so yeah there. yeah you especially know. especially with um you know, we, we talked again about the difference between the situational awareness and decision making cameras. You really got to be intimately familiar with your camera that you're going to be using. Does it have a nine hertz processor that's not going to be as fast as a 30 hertz or 60 hertz processor? The human eye, you know, sees, sees right around 30 hertz, sees 28 hertz. So is it if it's three times slower than our eyesight? You know, what's that going to be like for a, a firefighter that's that's amped up inside trying to make that scan look? that he's going to have to really make a conscious effort to slow that scan down just so he doesn't outrun the camera. Yeah. Now, think, then you have the problem. You, you, guys, you all heard that term hurts when you were out buying a TV, right? Everybody wants 120 yeah. hertz or 320, whatever hertz, right? Because it's got the quickest refresh rate. Well, the human eye, he said, is only like 38, you said? No, it's 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 right around thirty hertz. I think it's, yeah. I think it's twenty seven hertz exactly. If, if I've read a couple of different numbers, but twenty seven is what I typically go with. So it's it, it's three times slower than your you, as as my friend John Lightly likes to say. You know, John's one of our other instructors. He said it's three times slower than your God given eyesight. So you know, think about that whenever you're using it. All right, more on proper training. One thing, again, I know um, it's really tough for us to get to the burn building and practice these things and put put uh, firefighters in a heated environment and so that we understand this. Because of that, if we when we do our training on the apparatus floor, you can get this false sense that every victim is going to look white. So be careful. And I understand, right? You want to practice these things and you want to get out and do your scan and you want to do it where you can in your, in your uh, app. And maybe you do it in the firehouse, in the, in the bunk room or, or in the offices where you do this and you hide somebody, but just be careful because they're going to look white in that, in that environment. But when we go to a fire, an actual victim may look dark. Yeah. So it, th with with victim identification, just just a few things to throw out on that, you know, the background temperature of the environment is going to play in with how they're going to look. You know, if, if the background environment is colder than them, they're going to be bright white, like what's in the left hand side of the screen. And if it's super heated, if it's hotter than 98.6 degrees or however, whatever temperature they're admitting, you know, they're it, they're going to be darker and the background's going to be lighter. But, you know, we, we really shouldn't, while it's okay and it's good to learn that information, we should learn that information. We also should realize that most of our victims or people we're going to be looking at, they're going to be covered up by something. They're going to have clothes on. Maybe they got on a winter jacket, you know, that's insulated. It's not going to let some of that heat come through. So we might just have a hand that is visible. And so you're going to have a smaller target and it's not going to be as easily identifiable. 
So the way that, that the thermal imaging camera can really be used to speed up our search is seeing layout and those target search areas that we know that we, we have a good chance of finding victims around, you know, furniture that they would have been sitting, laying, sleeping on, and then the areas that they may be trying to get to to get out of the building. So kind of like helping us find those high target areas where they might have been. The, yeah, that's a good point, yep. too. Maybe they're in the bed and they were covered up with a blanket. So there might only right. be a might only yeah. be a head or a right. No, that's that's a good 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 stuff. Good good yeah. basic info. Or you might be so close to them, you might be so close to them that all you see is a portion of their leg or a portion of their arm because you know you think about how far back you have to be from a six foot human to get the whole six foot human in the in the screen. There's a lot of variables there. You know, temperature, distance, um, the temperature of things that they're laying on. And, and, you know, if they're alive or if they've passed away, because if they've passed away, their body temperature is going to start to assimilate to the environment's temperature and it's going to blend in. That's also a good point where you say that um, these are tools to enhance our capabilities, not to replace them. So you identify a bed. You haven't searched the bed. You've identified the bed. So make sure you get out there and then put your hands on it to confirm that that there's nobody there. No, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, the way that the way that I, I teach my crews and that we teach or teach us when we travel is, you know, if I take a scan before I enter that bedroom to search my camera and I see the beds to the left, that's where I'm, that's the direction I'm going to go to start my search. So, you know, it's not clearing the bed. It's just giving that information of uh, there's there's the, the primary piece of furniture that we know we should probably search is this direction. I know I'm going to whenever I get around there, if it's if my vision's obscured, I'm, I know what I'm running into, so to speak. And then, you know, we might the other things that we might we might identify or communicate to somebody is just a uh, exterior egress point or vent point. So, you know, if we can find that room, we want to take the window to, to help clear some of that stuff out. The camera can help us see that. And then uh, cool. that, that's really it. We don't need to muddy the waters with any more information than that. What about um, what about like training with a with, a let's say, a fire pit or a, a burn barrel to kind of to, to show the changing of uh, of the high and low sensitivity? Yeah, no, I think that's great. And we use the, the, the uh, gas stove a lot for that, to, for showing new members if we don't have any live fire or a, a small scale prop that we can easily pull out anything. That is, that is going to switch that that camera from high sensitivity to low sensitivity just to show them what it's doing and show them the collar palette is a great first step. Obviously, it's not it, it shouldn't all your thermal imaging training shouldn't just consist of that, but it is a great first step. And it's a great refresher training. You know, in FPA, uh, you were talking about everybody, the training that everybody's received, the proper training, as, you, as your slide says. There, there's a whole sta NFPA standard on it. NFPA standard 1408 is is on the care, maintenance, and training of thermal imaging cameras. So it's it's literally written out there what you should be doing annually for your firefighters as far as thermal imaging cameras. All right. Well, I just want to say a little something about Insight. Again, um, you guys are the official a thermal imaging camera training company for of Mayday Mondays. And I appreciate everything you, you came on and said. This is uh, really good stuff. Um, is, here's some of those videos. Um, I don't know, Mark, if you could show one. Here's one that it's linked in this. This is Joey Baxter with Insight Fire Training, here today to give you a quick thermal imaging tip and talking about beginning our scan with a thermal imaging camera. We have a bad habit. Right, that's good. But that's, uh, that's Joey. That's Joey doing a video um, on the Insight uh, site on YouTube. It's linked in this month's um, in this month's Mayday Monday on how to perform that tick scan. And remember, uh, this is something you could then practice in your firehouse where you don't need live fire. You don't need smoke. You would go through the motions of performing that tick scan to reinforce what the proper thing is. Another video is this one here, also from Insight where it talks about um, temperature modes and some other basic stuff. Mark, can you show that one? Welcome to Insight Fire Training Thermal Imaging Training Series. Today we're going to be talking about temperature modes and TI basic color palette. We begin by looking at a video where the camera starts off in the high sensitivity mode. All cameras start off in the high sensitivity mode if the environment is less than 300 degrees. That's good, Mark. All right, so a couple of videos there. There are many more. Um, from Insight on their site that um, 
you can look at. Uh, there's other other information on on how you can get those guys. Um, all kinds of things that you could do on um, Insights page on YouTube. So uh, that really, again, uh, hopefully this, this this kind of touched and wet, whetted your appetite for getting more information about the thermal imaging camera. Um, again, uh, you can look at this month's fire engineering on social media and you will find a link to those videos. Um, Joey, uh, if, uh, if there's the best way, if anybody wants to get some more information is just get onto Insights website or how else could they maybe reach out to find you guys? So uh, I would have glad, I'll gladly give you my contact information if you don't put it with everything else. But uh, the best way just to tell you through this is find my instructor page on Facebook, Instructor Joey Baxa. That just search that, it'll, it'll come right up and uh, shoot me a message through there. All my other contact information's on there. Um, links to videos, like like you said, the YouTube page is a is a wonderful place to look for uh, things. Even if you want to look before, maybe you ask your question, but we'll gladly point you in the right direction. There's videos for for most cameras on there already in playlists, to where you can pull them up and show them to your company of the actual camera that you have uh, training videos that correspond right back to it. I think one of the one of the other things that we really didn't touch on tonight is using that camera to to assist with fire attack. We all think of it as being like a search tool, but uh, imagine how much more efficient you would be if you could use the camera to determine that's where the fire room is or uh, if, if it's so dark, right, there's so much smoke, you can't see the flames Well, the thermal imaging camera can direct you to exactly where to, to shoot the water. So, so again, uh, thank you so much, Joey. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for, uh, for helping me out at, uh, West Virginia. Um, <laughs> thank I, you I hope that we just use it. I just call you for a visit and not to go bail her out or something, but, um, <laughs> you'll assist with that. So everybody, um, that's another major Mayday Monday podcast. Um, please uh, do some, get out there and do some thermal imaging practicing, get, do some drilling with that and uh, get the basics down. Cause again, firefighter survival starts with the basics. So thank you. And uh, we'll see you in November.